Thank you for joining me today. My name is Sarah Joy, and you are listening to Haladin Music's podcast series on the Baroque era. In today's episode, episode two, we'll be discussing the stylistic characteristics that were unique to this time period, which was roughly between 1600 and 1750. Some notable composers that you might know from this period are Bach, Handel, Vivaldi, Monteverdi, and many others that I will try to get to throughout this series. Before we get started, I want to let you know that Haladin Music created a wonderful Spotify playlist with the complete pieces that are included in this series. So in the podcast itself, we just play cuts and clips from these pieces, but if you would like to listen to the full versions, you can visit that playlist. Now let's talk about what the word Baroque actually means and where it comes from. The word is derived from the Portuguese word Baroco, which means oddly shaped pearl which seems like a funny term to use to describe any kind of music or art. And actually, during that time period, so 1600 to 1750, if someone used that word to describe a piece of art, they were basically saying that it was grotesque or uh, distorted, misshapen. But many years later, when people started using the word Baroque to describe that particular era, it had lost those negative connotations, and now the term is used to describe something that is grand, dramatic, expressive, lots of with lots of ornamentation. Now, I want you to keep in mind the adjectives that I just used, and we're gonna listen to Vivaldi's Concerto for Two Cellos in G Minor, Largo. And this particular recording is arranged for cello and contrabass. And I want you to hold those descriptions in your head as you listen, And that might give you a better idea of what people mean when they use the term Baroque to describe this era and the music, literature, art, everything art from this time period. There are two main things that I want to talk about in today's podcast. The first one is the distinction between monophony, homophony, and polyphony. The second one is to talk about basso continuo, or in English, it just means continuous bass. Let's start out by defining monophony. Monophony is just a single melodic line without any kind of accompaniment or any other lines that are being played or sung along with it. So... It could be a melodic line that's played by multiple instrumentalists. It could just be sung by a single person. It could be whistled, just a tune that's being whistled. Basically, just any melodic line that doesn't have anything else going on with it. No accompaniment, no additional lines. Homophony, this is a melody line that has an accompaniment underneath it. So whenever you see someone sit down and sing, accompanying themselves with the guitar or the piano, That's a great example of homophony, single line with accompaniment underneath. Now, polyphony, and this was the main way of writing in the Renaissance period, which was the period directly before the Baroque period. Polyphony is when you have multiple independent melodic lines being played or sung at the same time, and each of those lines pretty much is of equal importance. So the top line is important, middle line's super important, and they each have their own personalities, their own characters. Um, they're, yeah, they're each their own character. And then the bottom line, again, just as important, its own personality. All right. Now I have a listening example for you, which I think is really interesting. It's the current from, uh, sweet six. Yes. Sweet six of Bach's unaccompanied cello suites and all of his unaccompanied cello suites. They are performed by a single cello player. Some people would say that that is a great example of monophony, but I'm going to argue that this is actually a great example of implied polyphony. And you might be thinking, well, that's kind of confusing. I don't understand. If monophony is just a single line of music, which you just described, then how is that anything like polyphony, which is multiple lines happening at the same time? Well, that 
is what's so cool about this example. And it shows some of Bach's genius because he was able to condense multiple lines into a single line. And you can say, you know, you could argue three to four voices are included in that single line. The number depends on how you analyze it, how you want to look at it. But basically, he had a top line and a middle line or some middle lines, a low bass line. And each of those lines had their own personality. They were each their own character and there was interplay between them. Um, but then you might think, okay, well, how did you do that? Well, let's say, for example, there are two notes down here. And then you jump up and you play two notes up here. Well, yeah, if you look at it like this, it's just a single line, right? You're going no, no, and then you jump up, no, no. But this voice, these two notes down here are their own separate voice. This voice has something to say down here. This voice up here, these two notes up here, this is a separate character. It has something to say that's different. And so it's a conversation. Somehow Bach managed to write this intricate conversation, this interesting polyphonic conversation into a single melodic line, which, you know, from the outsider, from, from first listen, you could think of, well, okay, this is just monophony. But again, I would like to argue, and I hope I did a decent job of presenting my case, that this is indeed a fantastic example of uh, at least implied polyphony. So, okay, I digress. Let's go ahead and take a listen and see if you can catch what I am describing. <laughs> have at least a general understanding of what those terms mean, I want to talk about how homophony and polyphony were treated and used in the Baroque era, especially in contrast to the previous period, the Renaissance period. So in the Renaissance era, polyphony was the way that composers thought about music. That's how they wrote. But then in the Baroque era, the composers started showing interest in an interesting concept. They, they were attempting to recreate and reconstruct the Greek ideal of music. Now, there was a lot of discussion and debates on how to achieve this because they didn't have a lot to go off of. There wasn't much documentation about what music was like back then. So after a lot of discussion, um, a general consensus was that the text or what we would call the lyrics were of utmost importance. You know how whenever you're listening to someone speak, their voice has, oh, what is the word for that? Um, a natural inflection. There's kind of a melody built into their speech unless they have a monotone way of speaking. Composers of the time felt that the music underneath should enhance that because they wanted to make sure that the text was being articulated clearly that the audience could really understand what was being said. Now, as you can imagine, the use of polyphony was basically against, it worked against this aim, this goal of theirs. Because in polyphony, let's say, for example, you have six singers all singing at the same time, you can imagine that the waters would be a little bit muddied, right? In terms of being able to hear the words that they're actually singing. And the composers really, did, they thought this was a problem. And so what they did to fix it is that they did indeed start heading in the direction of homophony, homophonic writing. So instead of having six people singing all at the same time and kind of, you know, making it hard to understand, um, they would have one person, or I suppose multiple people, singing a single melodic line. That way the audience could clearly hear what was being said and the music underneath was just there to enhance and support that main line. 
This was a huge change, an enormous change. It was one of the foundational building blocks of opera. It's basically how our music works today. You turn on the radio and you're going to hear homophonic music. This leads me to talk about the second thing, basso continuo or continuous bass, which is um, basically, <laughs> sorry, um, a single low line that isn't just a held note, right? It's not just a drone, a single note where lots of stuff is happening on top. It's an interesting independent line that goes somewhere, has a beginning, has an end, it takes you on, a, on, a, on an adventure. So you have this bass line, and then from there you have chords stacked on um, those notes in the bass line. This line was the harmonic foundation of the entire piece. Now, as we wrap up today's podcast, one of the main takeaways that at least I've personally gained from thinking about this topic, I think that one of the biggest shifts was in the conceptualization of how we should analyze and compose music in terms of linear, horizontal versus vertical. And I don't know if I can make this make sense to anyone else, but I'm going to do my best. In polyphonic writing, the emphasis truly was on horizontal, linear movement of every single voice. The change happened with the integration of homophonic writing, and we went from horizontal thinking to more vertical thinking. And so we're, th we're thinking and we're analyzing now instead of, again, this linear movement, instead we're thinking in terms of chords and stacking stacking notes. We're thinking harmonically rather than melodically. Not entirely, it's not black and white, but I think that there's certainly a shift in emphasis. Regardless of whether I was able to communicate my ideas clearly on that topic, at least you have gotten a sense of what these terms mean and how music was constructed during this era, and the huge importance that these changes had on the music that we listen to today. All right, I think that I talked about everything I wanted to in today's podcast. I hope that you're enjoying the series, and I'm very excited for the next episode. I'm going to be continuing to discuss the stylistic characteristics that were unique during this time period, so I'm very excited about that, and as always, thank you for listening. <laughs>